Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dharmasar Taro, and I'm here with the 20th episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Remember last time we were talking about how Nibbana is a kind of cooling down, a type of extinguishing of the fire of suffering, the fire of lust, the fire of desires. So the problem is people in this world are suffering so much that they'll do anything to get a little relief. And the Buddha compares that to a man with leprosy, roasting his limbs over a fire to try to heal the sores. So everyone is looking for this fire. Huh? Come on, baby, light my fire. <laughs> Not realizing that this is only going to increase the suffering and result in a greater entanglement in the problems of material life. So Nibbana goes the other way. Nibbana is a type of cooling. It's compared to extinguishing a fire. When a fire goes out, because it runs out of fuel or anything like that. It simply is gone. It doesn't go anywhere. And in the same way, Nibbana is not a place where we go. <laughs> it's simply the fire of desire, the fire of becoming, going out. And that's really all there is to it. So how do we get the fire of becoming to go out? Well, that's the whole purpose of the Noble Eightfold Path. So when the Arhats attain Nibbana, they do so by cooling down this fire. With a steadfast mind and applying themselves well in the dispensation of the Buddha Gotama, free from defilements, they have attained to that which should be attained, our huntship by encountering the deathless. They enjoy the appeasement of Nibbana freely obtained. This precious jewel is the Sangha. By this declaration of truth, may there be protection. Now, this is a chant that is chanted every day in every Buddhist monastery. <laughs> at least every Theravada Buddhist monastery. But somehow they don't get it. Somehow they still think that Nibbana is something you have to earn, something you have to work for, something you have to go to, or a thing that you have to get. But actually, it's not like that at all. It's simply the relinquishment of desire, the appeasement of, of this war that we have with the way it is, Dhamma. Huh? The way it is isn't good enough for us. We have to start a, a whole process of becoming to make it in some other way. But that's not going to make us happy. That's not going to give us the protection that we seek. The protection, the jewel, Ratana means jewel. Huh? The jewel the pearl of great price, as Jesus described it in the Bible, for which a man would go and sell everything he has uh, just to purchase it. That jewel, that, that appeasement, the end of desire, that is Nibbana. So the Ratana Sutta says, Ladha mudha nibuting bhunjamana. They enjoy the appeasement of Nibbana, freely obtained. There's no price for it. There's no, ha no doing, no trading, no exchange, no buying, no purchase that will get it for us. Huh? We simply have to sit down and allow this fire of desire to go out by not giving it any fuel. So the extinction of craving is all by itself very blissful. 
One time, Venerable Sariputta was asked, well, if Nibbana is the end of existence, then how can it be blissful? And he said, this end of existence is by itself very, very blissful, very, very peaceful, very enjoyable. So our meditation should be like that too. Our approach to Nibbana should be blissful, should be joyful, should be pleasure. Instead, people turn it into this, like a workout, <laughs> like a contest, you know, a competition. Who can reach Samadhi first? No, it, it shouldn't be like that at all. First of all, we shouldn't practice in a group. We should practice in a solitary. We should go by ourselves somewhere where we won't be disturbed and simply sit down and wait and see what happens. People get all hung up on these different methods and systems and they think they have to apply this special system where there's some secret method or something like that, but it's not a secret at all. It's all described very, very clearly in the suttas. And the problem is people don't read the suttas. Instead, they read commentaries like the Sudhimaga by Buddha Ghosh. But unfortunately, Buddha Ghosh wasn't a practitioner. He was an academic. He was a scholar. He was a man of letters, a man of words. And all he knew was, well, I'm trying to make these words all make sense. But you can't make sense about something that you don't know. In other words, I, I had never been in a race car in my life. Well, the closest was I used to have a sports car when I was in college. <laughs> but I've never been in a Formula One or a real race car in my life. So for me to write a book about racing would be ludicrous. It would be crazy. The first rule of writing, the advice, very good advice given by Ernest Hemingway, is write what you know. So if you live something every day, you can easily write about it. You can easily talk about it because you're experienced. It's fresh in your mind. But if you don't know it, if you haven't lived it, if it's not part of your experience, to write about it is irresponsible. That's why I never took a gig as a ghost writer. <laughs> because... Writing somebody else's story is always going to come across as inauthentic. And even if, it's, even if you're able to fool the audience, you can't fool yourself. And I have to live with that guy that I see in the mirror every morning. So everything I discuss here is part of my experience. And that's why I can talk about it. That's why I can just, I can talk about it all day long. <laughs> and never run out of things to say because it's my experience every day, every morning when I get up and every night when I go to sleep. So someone who has tasted this Nibbana, someone who has put away these desires and especially the desire to be, the, des the desire to be I, they know this. They can feel this. And the Buddha compares it to someone with uh, their hands and feet cut off. Sandaka, I will give you a comparison. For some wise men understand when a comparison is given. Sandaka, if a man's hand and feet are cut off, in whatever posture he may be, he would know my hands and feet are cut off. And reflecting, he would know my hands and feet are cut off. In like manner, the bhikkhu who is perfect has destroyed desires, has done what should be done, put down the burden, has come to the highest good, has destroyed the desire to be, and rightly knowing is released, would know constantly and continually my desires are destroyed. So we know, we know when we put down this desire, uh, when we do what needs to be done, when we get rid of this artificial process of I and mind making, 
then we know it's done, it's finished, it's over, it's cut off, no more desires. Now, I'm not saying that we should uh, actually cut off a part of ourselves. <laughs> actually, this process of eye-making <laughs> is not part of the being, the space of awareness that we really are. But that is an artificial addition. Huh? It's like if I took a, a, a carrot and pasted it onto my nose, and then you see this long carrot sticking out. Well, is that really a part of me? No. It's artificial, isn't it? It's synthetic. And if I was to cut this carrot off, then I wouldn't be missing anything, really, would I? So in the same way, this I and mine is an artificial extension. It's synthetic. It's a fabrication. So we don't really need it. And it's not really part of who we are, what we are. And so when it's done, when it's over, when it's gone, when it's cut off, we don't miss it. But we know that it's gone because we lived with it for such a long time. So in the same way, the uh, people who are trying to present the Buddha's path as a religion, or as a philosophy, or as a system, or a method. They're not getting it. They're not seeing what it really is. Nibbana is not a something. It's the absence of something. It's the absence of this artificial I and mine. This uh, limitless process of creating desires and trying to fulfill them. Don't we have anything better to do? I do. Anyway, the unfortunate thing is that uh, Theravada Buddhism has become overlaid and covered up with this artificial, synthetic, unnecessary process of scholarship that was borrowed from South Indian Brahmanism by Buddha Ghosh and similar writers. And they took it from the path of the Buddha into a path of yoga, from a path of letting go and allowing the process of making desires to stop, to a path of trying to impose our will and force the desires to stop. That's the path of yoga. That's not the path of the Buddha. The path of the Buddha is just sit there. Just sit there and do nothing and spend enough time sitting there doing nothing that the normal habits of our mental life can gradually stop. That's really meditation. So this has led to a very unfortunate situation, whereas now we have a bunch of college trained literally university-trained preachers who are giving this message of the Buddhist path as yoga instead of the way it originally is. And they are able to shout out and drown out the voices of the actual practitioners, those who have actually realized Nibbana. And it resonates with something in us because of our conditioning because we've gone to school, we've gone to university. Uh, we were taught that we have to do in order to know. And that's just not the, the a path of the Buddha at all. The path of the Buddha is non-doing, no self, no mind. Just relax and it will fall off by itself. So the false image created by Buddha Ghosh and other scholars who were not practitioners, and they admitted they weren't practitioners. In fact, they even held a debate between the scholars and the practitioners where they said, well, we don't need this practice. All we need are the books to pass on the Buddha's teaching. So you don't have to be an expert practitioner to be a guru or a monk or a teacher. I disagree. 
I think that by allowing the scholars to become dominant, Buddhism has gone off the path of the Buddha and turned into something completely different from what it originally started out to be. And this is only exacerbated by Buddhism in the West, because in the West, of course, we're addicted to doing to the max. And this is the problem. The people who are attached to the words and symbols think they know, but actually they don't know because they're not practicing. There's a nice passage in the Kalakarama Sutta. Whatever is seen or heard or sensed or clung to as true by others, amidst those self-fettered by their views, being such, I hold none as true or false. That barb I beheld well in advance, that arrow where generations are fastened and hung. I know, I see, that's just how it is. No such clinging for the Tathagatas. This is the Buddha speaking. This is his mood. He says, you think you know, huh? You know, this is right, this is wrong. I know this, I know that. But you're actually self-fettered by your views. You're trapped. You put yourself in a box, and now you can't get out. You can't see the way because you've taken the symbol as the reality. You've taken the word as the truth. And it's not. And now you think you know, and nobody can convince you otherwise. And so you have no chance at all to see. But the Buddha already saw that coming. He said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to say that this is true or this is false. I'm simply going to say, this is the process. This is the way. And if you read the suttas, you'll see how the Buddha preaches, how he teaches. Someone will try to tell him, well, certain wise men say this and that. Do you agree or disagree? And the Buddha will say, no, I don't accept either. <laughs> I don't accept any position. I simply know that because of ignorance, <laughs> there is fabrication. And because of fabrication, there's consciousness. And because of consciousness, there's name and form and so on. In other words, the process of becoming. The Buddha saw that clearly. And so he was able to avoid the trap of thinking that significance is reality. But significance is just fabrication. The actual reality is experience. And we can experience all these things if we simply follow the Buddha's process. There's another nice sutta which I'd like to close with. Bhikkhus Suppose there was a mountain river sweeping downwards, flowing into the distance with a swift current. If on either bank of the river, kasa grass or kusha grass were to grow, it would overhang it. If rushes, reeds or trees were to grow, they would overhang it. If a man being carried along by the current should grasp the kusha grass, it would break off and he would thereby meet with calamity and disaster. If he should grasp the kasa grass, it would break off, and he would thereby meet with calamity and disaster. If he should grasp the rushes, reeds, or trees, they would break off, and he would thereby meet with calamity and disaster. So, too, bhikkhus, the uninstructed worldling regards form as self, or self as possessing form, or form as in-self, or self as in form. That form of his disintegrates, and he thereby meets with calamity and disaster. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, volitional formations as self, consciousness as self, or as self-possessing consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That consciousness of his disintegrates, and he thereby meets with calamity and disaster. So this is the fate 
of those who believe in this or that view. Without right view, our meditation is a waste of time. Without understanding the whole of the Buddha's teaching, not just a system, not just an isolated method, but the whole teaching, then when we sit down to meditate, then we understand the point of view of the Buddha, that none of this is I, none of this is myself, none of this is mine. And that is the actual foundation for Nibbana. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Bhavantu Sukhitatta